Hello everyone. <laughs> so this is a production that Anil and I have been working for over two years now. We've done about 10 shows. This is um, a place where we marry myth with music. Um, the head with the heart and we connect the head and heart through the senses. So from Indriyas we go to the Chitta, from Chitta we go to the Mana. And that's the journey that we'll go because I can access you only through your sense organs. And through the sense organs we will work towards your heart and from the heart we shall go towards the head hopefully. Um, it's not important, the head is not important in this session. The heart is and senses definitely is. Um, and we begin the, the, and that's why the title of the session is very sensory, black and white. We want the sensations to open up, what is called the Jnana Indriyas, because unless the senses open up, you will not be able to receive Ras. And unless you receive the Ras, you will not experience the bhava and if you don't get the bhava, vichar or the thought will never reach you. To bypass the senses and the heart and then straight go to the head is to miss the magic of Indian thought. This session is about Indian thought as expressed in the Purans. The thought itself is found in the Vedas but in the Vedas it is like a seed and you can't really taste a seed. You don't know the flavors of a seed. So the seed has to germinate, it has to transform into a plant and the plant has to bear flowers and from the flowers comes the fruit and when you bite the fruit you should get the rich juices to enter your mouth and when the flavors touch your senses you will experience the Vedic idea which is located in the seed. So if the Vedas are the seed, Puranas are the fruit. And in this fruit are many, many stories and many, many moods, many, many experiences. And we'll take you through this. Why black and white? It is not sponsored by Fair and Lovely. But it is because these are, of course, very obviously the piano and most not so obviously the way the gods are designed. So Krishna Dhaval, those who remember the old Durdarshan television, black and white TV was called Krishna Dhaval. And Krishna is black and Balaram is Dhaval, fair complexioned. The river Ganga is white. Yamuna is black, Kali is black but Shiva is white. Black, white, black, 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 white continuously manifests in the Indian storytelling. And why does it manifest? Because these colors are not designed to talk about color politics, but they're trying to experience a whole spectrum of emotions which exist like the colors between black and white. And we would like you to go through the spectrum of emotions. As you make the journey from Shiva to Shakti, as you make the journey from Kali to Gauri, as you make the journey from Krishna to Balaram, and these are the spaces that we will enter. And we'll begin of course, where will you begin? You will have to begin at the very beginning and we'll begin with a space which is white. The white mountains, the white icy peak of Mount Kailas. Mount Kailas is a mountain made of stone covered with snow and on top of that, on top of that mountain sits Shiva in serene meditation, his eyes are shut, he's unaware of the world, he's triangular, the mountain is triangular, the fire burning in front of him is triangular, upward pointing triangles. The mountain is white, he is white, covered with ash, his eyes are shut 
and in the dark night sky behind him is the moon sitting on his forehead the crescent moon just about to die soon it will be the new moon night there will be no moon in the sky it is shivaratri and there he is in serene silent stationary meditation and when he's sitting over there everything looks so wonderful but the goddess does not like it because stillness is not life life happens when there's quivering spandana movement when the waves happen when the ice has to melt with his passion otherwise the ganga will not flow and if the ganga will not flow what will make the earth fertile she has to arouse his passions he has to not be the cold god who has withdrawn all the heat inside him the tapasvi the yogi has to be made a bhogi he has to open his eyes he has to open his senses he has to experience pleasure he has to open up who will do it people are terrified he has a third eye that can turn everyone into ash but the goddess is not frightened she is the daughter of daksha prajapati she walks up the mountain and demands he love her he doesn't know what love is because for love to exist the other has to exist he is in nothingness in zero there is no one and therefore no two he opens his eyes allows himself to love and the daughter of daksha prajapati transforms the hermit into the householder they are married she thinks it will be a happy family life on one side her father on the other side her husband husband on top of the mountain refusing to go down and father at the bottom of the mountain in the city of kashi refusing to climb up the father says i will not be friend that mendicant who does not know the meaning of refinement and sacredness who lives in the crematorium who has friends as ghosts and dogs who dances like a madman i don't want him in my house and the daughter says but he's not a madman he's wise he has discovered nothingness and daksha says what's the use of it yagya is important exchange is important i invoke the devas i make offerings i give them something saying swaha in exchange they give me something else they saying tathastu this is life exchange he doesn't exchange he doesn't participate in the yagya i don't want him around sati tries to make her father see sense please engage with my husband then the father says no she goes to her husband and says please engage with my father he says i don't see the point of exchange he's a fool he believes in hierarchy he believes some people are better than others he expects me to bow to him i will not tone between a father who will not talk to the son in law and the husband who will not talk to the father in law upset angry sati jumps into the fire pit burns herself turns herself into ash and the cold shiva serene and calm suddenly experiences an explosion of emotions for the first time he experiences heartbreak and it transforms into rage the serene ascetic explodes in anger he dances and screams and yells and shouts he cuts the head of daksha prajapati refuses to be part of his world refuses to be part of those emotions rises up the mountain withdraws into a cave and says none of it shall be mine silence once again but the goddess is not one to give up she may have died in the fire pit she may have gone down but she comes back as the daughter of the mountains parvati she climbs the mountain and enchants him once again come down heartbreak is temporary you will outgrow it 
She teaches him how to love. He refuses. She says, come. What use is your knowledge if you don't share it with the rest of the world? What use is your serenity if you don't share it with the world? Come down. Not everybody is as smart as you and that is okay. Have some compassion for the other. And Shiva smiles. And like a child being led by his mother comes down from the mountain to the city of Kashi. She is Annapurna. Who does she feed? Because her husband is never hungry. He is Bhikshatana, the beggar. Who does he beg for? Because he doesn't want food. He does it for the other. They feed the other. They come down and they feed people many things. Food here is a metaphor. Metaphor for all the things that human beings need for their nourishment. So together they create music. Together they create dance. Together they tell stories. Katha Sarit Sagar, the ocean of stories, comes from Shiva. Natya Shastra comes from Shiva. Kama Shastra comes from Shiva. Everything comes from Shiva. It is because he fell in love after a heartbreak. Shok se shlok nikalta hai. From pain comes poetry. And that is where the arts come from. The arts emerge from this space. The movement from silence towards music happened after Sati fell down the fire pit in order to bring Shiva from the top of the Kailas to the city of Kashi.
the, the construction of the music also follows the theme of black and white. Music again consists of the combination of both cognitive as well as affective input in construction. So where there is structure or tandav, there needs to be emotion or lasya. There needs to be both in order to be able to construct the flow of the music. In constructing the music for sati, one plays with the idea of centeredness on one note, which is called the Adarashruti, in which everything else is encompassed and therefore that becomes the symbolism of Shiva. Because it is Shiva, a tritone nudges that note out of its stasis and starts making it move and that nudge is sati and that sati comes in the form of three notes so that becomes sati sati then is torn in the conflict between Daksha Prajapati and Shiva, one up the mountain and one down below and that is what you saw in terms of and then she jumps. The entire melody then undergoes a change by just one note and that one note is the explosive note and he spoke about explosion. And that one note is just this. It's so soft, it's so sinuous and it is so beautiful and yet even the person in the last row can hear this note and it changes the flavor of the entire thing and that note is Parvati going up the hill very gently and bringing a very recalcitrant Shiva down the mountain to Kashi below. And so the Puranic ideas are presented using color, geometry, music, storytelling, hoping that through the senses the heart is stirred enough that the head expands, the mind expands and we are able to see the world differently. To expand our vision of the world is what the Vedas are trying to do and they do it through storytelling and that is what happens. The Vedas which are full of ideas transform into the Puranas and in the Puranas we find stories. Stories of Shiva on one side, who is fair, and stories of Vishnu on the other, who is dark. Shyamarang, dark colored. Vishnu is dark. He is with the earth. This going up and coming down is such a recurring theme and it occurs in the word avatar, or what many Americans called avatar. And I'm saying this for a reason, because many a times, if you play a video game, if you're playing Xbox, avatar is just a mask that you can wear, and that's not the meaning of the word avatar. And that's the tragedy, that we don't understand that avatar doesn't mean superhero. Superheroes are ordinary people who become extraordinary. Ordinary to extraordinary. Avatar is someone who has, whose mind has expanded infinitely. So who has infinite wisdom coming down and taking the form of being finite. So from the infinite to the finite is the journey of the avatar. Very opposite from ordinary to extraordinary. Very different, right? But yet, James Cameron didn't get it. <laughs> and we hope to explain it. These ideas, these ideas are very subtle. 
When we say Indian thought is different, this is what it means. How do you explain Ananta coming to the world of mortals? How does infinite behave when he has to engage with the finite? If you had all the knowledge in the world, how would you deal with your husband? If you knew his past, his future, you knew everything about him. If there was nothing that would surprise you, how would you engage? You will have to play act. You will have to do Leela. As mothers have to do with their children, every time they are trying to feed the child. And food becomes a bird which flies in the air and the child opens its mouth in wonder and in goes the food. Which is exactly what the avatars are doing all the time. And of course we begin with the boring avatar of Ram. Ram is boring, right? And yet what we don't understand that this is a very strange avatar. He is the finiteness who is not supposed to know he is infinite. Because if he knows he is infinite, he cannot kill the demon. That's the boon the demon has asked. Ravan asks his father, I want to be killed by someone who is not a god or doesn't know he is God. Very different from Krishna who always knows he is God. He doesn't have to kill Ravan. Different strokes for different folks. Different avatars for different Rakshasas. This is called customization. <laughs> so when you come down the mountain into the, from the world of the infinite to the world of the finite, you have to start customizing. You have the finite, the infinite database has to become a small database, a little Excel sheet in order to suit the situation. And therefore, when he descends, the dark Vishnu, for whom songs are sung in Tamil Nadu by the Alvar priests, who are celebrated, he descends as Ram, the eldest son of a royal family. How does the eldest son of a royal family have to behave? That's the question. He has to do the Leela. But really it's not quite a Leela because he doesn't know he's divine. So Ram doesn't do Leela. He has to be just true to what he's doing. So Maryada Purushottam Ram. And when he descends, it's a very interesting because it's a story. The only person who understands him is Sita. She understands him. And this is the best way to explain the Ramayana. It's a love story between two birds. You know, in the beginning of the Ramayana, Valmiki shows this beautiful story that Valmiki is inspired by this incident. They say that he sees two love birds flying in the air and the hunter shoots one of the birds. The male bird dies and the female bird weeps around the dead bird and cries and cries. And this is your foreshadowing. Those who watch Game of Thrones know what foreshadowing is, right? This is foreshadowing. This is Valmiki is telling this is what the Ramayana is about. It is about Karunaras, about Viraha, about separation, about love that shall not be unrequited. It is the love story of a bird, two birds, one inside the cage and one outside the cage. Who is inside the cage? Maryada Purushottam Ram, locked in a cave of rules, rules of the royal family. He cannot take decisions. All decisions are taken for him by tradition, by royal rules. Riti and Niti have decided his entire life. His whole life is decided for him. Which school he'll go to, how he'll get a wife, what he's going to do in college, everything. He can't choose his career. Sita is outside, the daughter of Janaka. She is the bird outside. They both fall in love. She will never go into the cage. He will never leave the cage. It is a tragic love story from the start. Ramayana is a story of five choices. Whose choices? Sita's choices. We are never told the Ramayana that way. We are too eager to see Indian heroines crying and dying. 
That's what makes great Bollywood movies. The best directors make beautiful women dress up beautifully in the most fabulous clothes. In the end, the women cry or die. And that makes money. But that's not the Ramayan. At least not the way Ramayan was written. It is the way the Ramayan is transmitted. But that's not what the Ramayan is about. The Ramayan is about discovering the, the tragedy of love. That you can love someone and the someone can love you back, but society will pull you away. It will conspire to pull you away. And you yearn for that love with wisdom. You don't hate people who pull you apart. Ram doesn't, is not angry with Kai Kai for throwing him into the jungle. He says, karma hai. This is fate. This is the life I'm supposed to lead. He doesn't breathe, says that, oh my God, what a foolish father. What a foolish family. There is no rage on his face and yet when Sita is thrown into the jungle we want to see her sad isn't she the daughter of Janaka looks at this and says what a tragic situation people could have been noble but they chose to be locked in a cave in a cage she is disappointed disappointed at the opportunities you see it's very interesting Ram tells Sita don't come to the forest. She says, I will come to the forest. Lakshman tells Sita, don't cross the line. She does cross the line. Hanuman says, ride on my back and we can escape from Lanka. Sita says, no, my husband. She's always saying no. Choice one, choice two, choice three. But we are not told the Ramayana this way. She's Janaka's daughter. She's the wise one. When Ram says, don't come back to Ayodhya. Because Ram knows the rules of the game. If the kidnapped wife comes back to the city, the city will not accept. He says, go with anyone you want. You're completely free. She says, no, I will come back with you. I'll prove that I am pure. And he's looking at her with tragic eyes. That's not the point. It's reputation. How do you prove a stained or unstained reputation? That's the tragedy of these moments. He has no faith in his people. She does. They don't mind. Of course they mind. Even in Ram Rajya, they want to gossip. Even when the king gives you everything, you want to gossip. Why do you want to gossip? Where from comes the desire to gossip? Story of unrequited love. And you find that in Lanka too, unrequited love. Women who love these men who are so powerful. There is Ravan. Powerful. And really powerful, right? Everybody loves Ravan. Nowadays, every contrarian loves Ravan. Who wouldn't love Ravan? <coughs> 10 heads, 20 hands, private jet. <laughs> Everybody loves Ravan. Meri patni, meri patni, teri patni, meri patni. Which in modern uh, corporate language is my way or the highway. Everybody wants to be this perfect alpha male. Isn't he more exciting than the man in the cage? Mandodari loves him and wonders whether he'll look at her. He does with one of his ten eyes. With the other eye he looks at Urvashi and Rambha and Sita. But he is so dashing. He must be more delightful. And therefore in Ramayana you see unrequited love. Mandodari who stands by a man who she knows is improper. Sita who loves a man who knows will never step out of the cage. The next time he says come back to Ayodhya, he knows the answer. She is going to say no. Once I told you to stay in the palace, you said no. Once I said, come back from the forest, you will still say no. That's the Ramayana of unrequited love. You may be perfect for each other. Even the infinite when it comes on earth has to deal with the problems of life. There is no escape from suffering. Not even for God.
So we move from the eldest son of the royal family to the youngest son of the cowherd family. You can't compare the two because the rules of the game are so different. They exist in two different yugas, one in the Treta Yuga, where Ravan is the villain, and the other in the Dwapara Yuga, where the villainy is far more subtle. It's far more subtle. Ravan breaks the rules openly. But in this age, the villains don't break the rules openly. In fact, they follow the rules all the time. It's very easy to be corrupt without breaking the rules. It's called pretending. Many politicians know how to do it. The court will never find them guilty. The paperwork is perfect. The paperwork is always perfect because the letter of the law is used, not the spirit of the law. And the new world emerges where villains are tragic. Every villain is tragic. Kansa is a tragic villain. He's the child of rape. Jarasandh is a tragic villain. When he's born, he's born a mass of flesh which is thrown in the garbage bin until a Rakshasha stitches them together. Kansa raised by Putana, Jarasandha raised by Jara, they are damaged goods. And Duryodhan, whose father is blind and mother is blindfolded, you feel sorry for the victims when presented this way. And in the age of victimhood, they would be heroes. Krishna has to fight them. They all have a sad story to tell. How do you learn to fight them? And you learn this first from your mother, Yashoda, who churns butter. And when she churns butter, she is telling Krishna the story of the churning of the ocean. And she says, you know, the Devas and Asuras fought all the time, but Vishnu got them to collaborate. She made the force and the counterforce not fight each other, but work with each other. And it was very simple. He turned the tug of war into a churn. In a churn, there is a force and a counterforce. In a tug of war or arm wrestling, there is also force and counterforce. But there's a difference. In a tug of war, they work simultaneously. In a churn, they work sequentially and everyone pauses when the other is functioning it is possible to make opposite sides work that's what the mother is teaching as she's making butter and feeding her son butter rich creamy butter which Krishna hopes will make him fair and make his straighten his hair Look at the description of Krishna. Krishna is a very, that God is described constantly. Sringara Murti. He has curly hair and he's jealous of his elder brother Balaram who has thin, silky, long hair. And she says, his hair reaches the floor, mine doesn't. And the mother says, eat butter. She says, I am dark and everybody is fair. What do I do? Eat butter. And when he keeps complaining, she catches hold of him and puts chandan on his face and puts peacock feather on top of his top knot and covers him with forest garlands, vanamali, and makes him wear bright silk dhoti, the pitambar, so that everybody is dazzled by the decoration and nobody looks at her son. And that maternal emotion of Yashoda gradually transforms into a very different kind of emotion. And suddenly as the boy grows up, the maternal affection wanes and a new kind of emotion appears. Madhurya rasa, Sringara rasa, flirtations start, love starts, tug of war of a different kind, the stealing of clothes, the stealing of glances, makhan chor becomes chit chor, Raha Chor. Ram can never be Chor. 
Chor means thief. He is Maryada Purushottam Ram. It's to always be proper. Krishna can afford to steal hearts, steal clothes, steal butter, and still be loved. Because it is the intent. Where do I come from? Am I the predator who feeds on you? Or am I the lover who encourages you to, predator, to be my predator? I'm willing to be vulnerable in front of you. The women catch hold of him and dress him as a girl, saying, we'll teach you lessons, we'll make you a girl. And he says, put some more lipstick. And put more alta in my hand. And if you look at the Krishna statues with the flute in his hand, if you turn around the statue, he has a girl's plait. He's androgynous. He breaks the rules. He is not Maryada Purushottam. No cage for him. He's fluid. He wears flowers in his hair and dances as Banke Bihari ji. In the bang, he is bent. Banke Bihar is the forest, not the state. In the forest, in the meadow, the women dance with him in a circle. In the darkness of the night, bejeweled women leave the comfort and the security of their homes to dance around him while he plays the fruit. Think of it. If your car breaks down in a dark forest, even if it is Vrindavan, especially if it is today's Vrindavan, and your mobile phone is not next to you, what is the emotion that you will feel? Terror. No phone, car broken down in the middle of the Gangetic Plains of the 21st century. But in the mythical Brajabhumi, at night, middle of the night, outside the village, the women, fully bejeweled, come dancing and singing, forgetting father, brother, son, doesn't matter. And they dance. This is a visual expression of absolute security and comfort. Nobody is vulnerable, nobody is scared, no predator, no prey. Just love, just affection. Where everyone is equal, where everything is shared. Kanha belongs to you and to me. Radha is fair, Krishna is dark. In the Baul traditions it is said that when Shiva and Shakti were making love, Shiva is fair. Kali is dark. Kali is dark and is on top of Shiva who is fair. And then Kali says, I'm bored. I want to be Krishna. And Shiva says, if you are Krishna, then I'll be Radha. But the last time you were on top, this time I shall be on top. What are they talking about? Let your imagination run wild in Victoria Memorial. Because metaphors are for adults. For the rest, we shall keep it literal. Love, expressed in so many different ways. They're talking at every level. You see the tantric influence. What is tantric? Where the tana or the body is acknowledged. In mantra, you acknowledge the mind. Man, say mantra. Tan, say tantra. We are not allowed to talk about tantra because we are ashamed of our bodies. We are told to be ashamed of our bodies. And Krishna steals the clothes and says, come out, it's okay. Wrinkle free, everybody. All bodies are beautiful. I see the beauty in you. You are wonderful. And in this world of Vrindavan, it should last forever. This is Vilasa Bhumi. This is the joy of pleasure. This is Ranga Bhumi. Not Rana Bhumi. Ranga Bhumi. It should last forever, but it doesn't. Everything has to come to an end. Even the circular dance of the Gopikas.
The pattern of the Ras, of course, is a circular pattern which never ends. The idea of Avartanas in Indian classical music itself is something which is circular. If you actually go into the beginning of it, there is no beginning for Tal, there is no end of Tal. It's a cycle that keeps going again and again and again. In fact, the word rhythm itself is a word that comes from the Sanskrit hrit, which means cycle. And therefore, ritu means seasons and rhythm comes from the idea that something that goes in cycles again and again and again. I don't have to tell you what the other two songs I played were. If you don't know them, shame on you. <laughs> but the idea is that you can express love in so many different forms, even running around trees in the Victoria Memorial, as they've just said. But you will still keep coming back to the fundamental idea of the Ras. Just a small note on the previous musical interlude was the whole construction of two birds in love with each other set to the rag Kamas and how they come down and get into the illusion of going through the entire epic but then go back to sitting on a tree tittering in that rag Kamas as two birds in love. You see, when we talk of end and we talk of cycles, what has gone up has come down. What motivates you to go back up? Something has to motivate you to go back up. The cycle has to be complete. Some. Going back to the silence. Why would you want to go back to the silence? This beautiful Rasa Leela is taking place, but it comes to an end. Krishna has to leave Madhuban, Vrindavan, Gokul, the world of Bhagavata, the world of the women, and enter the world of the men, Mahabharata. It has a different world where woman is territory, land is territory, where dogs fight over meat and call themselves human. The Mahabharata comes, Krishna comes, Draupadi comes. Kansa, it begins with the killing of Kansa, then the killing of Jarasandha. Cities are burnt, Mathura is burnt, Draubad, uh, Dwarka rises, Khandav Prastha is burnt, Indra Prastha rises. It's a tale of violence. You are seeing yourself move towards not music but noise, the cacophony which we often call breaking news. Because everybody wants to shout, everybody has a story to tell, everybody is a victim, nobody wants to listen. That's the Mahabharat. Hundred brothers on one side, five brothers on the other. Who should take care of whom? Should the strong take care of the weak? Should the skilled take care of the unskilled? The five brothers are far more talented than all the hundred brothers put together. Who is stronger between the two? Who should take care of the other? The five brothers enjoy the insecurity of the hundred. The hundred hate the five. And therefore war all the time, burning each other's houses, fighting. And the five says, but we are the victims. We have only seven armies. They have eleven. Hundred brothers, eleven armies. They have more. We are the victims. And Krishna says, I will fight, support you. I will support the victims against the villains. I will fight them. We will defeat them. And you will rule the land for thirty-six years. At the end of thirty-six years, the five brothers have to go to heaven. The eldest Yudhishthira enters paradise and what does he see? In front of him the Kauravas, the hundred. He says, why are the villains in heaven? And Krishna says, but did you not defeat them? Have they not been already punished? You took their lands and ruled it for thirty-six years. When will you forgive them? When does punishment end? You killed them, all of them. When does punishment end? Even in paradise, you are not willing to give up your anger. How can heaven be yours? When you were alive, the hundred did not share the land with the five. 
when you are dead the five will not share paradise with the hundred tum mein fark kya raha and krishna smiles it's a helpless smile these are his children he can't be angry with them he is infinite they are finite he is trying to do uddhar lift them towards infinity but he fails we are always told that at the end of the bhagavad gita arjun was enlightened he wasn't what we are not told is in the sanskrit mahabharat which many people claim to read there is another gita called the anu gita at the end of the war at the end of the war krishna is sitting with yudhishthira when arjun comes and says can you please repeat and tell me in summary very briefly what you told me before the war and krishna gets angry he says that was an inspired moment and i gave you in 18 chapters 700 verses and you want me to repeat that we are not told the story right because we are told that bhagavad gita is perfect god told this to the common we were enlightened no even god is not a brilliant teacher when the student is stupid the helplessness of divinity is expressed in this most beautiful thing and the arrogance of man is best told in this story at the end of the war we are told that bhima and arjuna have a fight and competition who is the greatest warrior and they both krishna says i don't know i don't know which one of you were better because bhima is with his gadadhar bhim and dhanurdhar arjun both were great i don't know who's better why don't you ask the head on top of the hill it had a different perspective of the battle maybe he will tell you he will tell you who was the greatest warrior so bhim having defeated the Pan, the kauravas climbs up the mountain so does arjun they they reach the top of the mountain which overlooks the kurukshetra on top of the mountain is a tree on top of the tree is a head just a head not a body just a head and they ask the tree on the the head on the tree tell us who is the greatest warrior is it arjun or is it bhim and the tree says who is arjun who is bhim the head doesn't recognize them he says don't you know we are the pandavas we defeated the kauravas who are the kauravas he says didn't you see us fighting he says no what pandavas what kauravas what bhim what arjun i didn't see any of you i just saw a number of stupid kings killing each other for land they were cutting each other's head the blood was flowing it was soaking the earth and the earth goddess was drinking their blood with relish drinking blood reminds you of the goddess kali the earth is thirsty for blood while everybody is arguing and everybody is right and nobody is listening to krishna's flute or is geeta and the helpless divine watches this and realize silence which began as music has now turned into cacophony it's time for silence once again we have to return to the top of the mountain we have to withdraw we have to let go we can't change the world and the avatarana ends this is how the puranic cycle starts and that suffering that pain and therefore the buddhism and the idea of renunciation starts entering indian thought bahut kalah ho gaya abhi chalte hain kashi se leke kailas parbat tak aur wahan shiv ji ke jaise aankh band karenge mahadev ban jayenge and therefore the journey ends with the rise up the swa- swarga haronika mount rising up to swarga and beyond swarga to vaikuntha and beyond vaikuntha to kailas where there is silence once again and the white mountain and the upward pointing triangle and the crescent moon on top of shiva's head
Thank you. Thank you.